næste Bøje Larsens blog. Jeg håber, du vil glæde dig over den video, jeg præsenterer i dag. This video is about the difference between fact on the one hand and likelihood or probability on the other hand. The video also presents some general ideas about what changes took place around 1964 and the view and reality of businesses. This is perhaps the most important part of this video. Likelihood or probability, notice these words. These words belong to the field of theoretical statistics. I met the words likelihood and theoretical statistics during my bachelor's study at the Copenhagen Business School from 1964 to 1967. Formally, theoretical statistics do not belong to business economics. But for me, studying business economics at CBS, theoretical statistics have merged into business economics. When I started at CBS in 1964, the studies had just undergone an important reform from what we can call a tradesman school to a proper academic study. Now, the school should be able to compete on equal terms with the master's studies in economics at the University of Copenhagen. Let me admit that I hated the lessons and the homework in theoretical statistics. Most likely, because I was not good at it. But I managed and passed this subject. But the CBS teachings in theoretical statistics were also caused because CBS had hired an overly theoretically oriented professor for the subject, Professor Leakey Jensen. He was mainly interested in the mathematical side of theoretical statistics and how the, for me, often complicated formulas in the discipline were developed, proved, and understood. Now, I will give you the essence of theoretical statistics so you do not have to suffer my pain, but can get the key thought elements without this pain. First, let me describe the difference between theoretical statistics and descriptive statistics. Descriptive statistics were the old method connected with the pre-1964 tradesman school at CBS. Theoretical statistics was the new perspective that Professor Leakey Jensen brought in. Theoretical statistics focuses on the development and study of mathematical models and methods that underlie statistical analysis. Professor Leakey Jensen loved this side, as I mentioned. It deals with the formalization of statistical concepts and the development of mathematical theories that form the foundation of statistical inference and hypothesis testing. Descriptive statistics, which was the tradesman school approach to statistics, on the other hand, is about summarizing and presenting. Making slides, for instance, about if sales, prices, or earnings are going up or down. A central distinction in theoretical statistics is between facts and likelihood, as I have mentioned at the beginning of the video. In statistics, facts are generally understood as objective statements supported by empirical evidence. We have sold 200 pieces of product X and 100 pieces of product Y. Facts are facts. Likelihood, on the other hand, refers to the probability of a particular event or outcome occurring, for instance, our future sales, given the available data. These words might sound quite lofty, but they mean that it is a fact that we have sold XX or YY of a product. But now we are looking at the future and trying to guess or judge how much we will sell I in the next period, year, month, or week, and so on. We can compare this to the problem that the authority, which has to approve or disapprove a new drug for production, is facing. It is happily not enough for the producer of the drug to write a nice letter to the approving authority. In the USA, it is named the Federal Drug Administration, FDA, and say, We have Mr. Jones here, and he is cured by our fantastic new medicine. That is a fact. We have examined Mr. Jones, and he is fit and well. The FDA will and should answer, that is fine and okay with Mr. Jones. Congratulate him. But we need data about many people and if they are cured or not. One is not enough. Haven't you been to a statistical theory class? The not so clever drug producer might answer back and ask, how many people do you want it tested on? FDA, who is getting more and more irritated, answers. Your sample size should be 100 or 1,000, meaning that you should have tested it on 100 or 1,000 patients. As the sample size increases, we are sure that the drug you are producing really gives the benefits you claim. We need a level of confidence of 0.01%, meaning that only 1 in 1,000 is not cured. 
with less than kind regards from the FDA. Now, the not-so-clever drug producer knows that he is in deep water. He should have been to a course in theoretical statistics in order to live up to FDA's requirements. And to illustrate the difficult subject of sampling and levels of confidence, let me use this explanation using oranges, which I used in my first video on business economics. The statistician, who is helping the owner, who most likely has not been in any theoretical statistics courses either, would first establish the population of interest, which in this case would be all the oranges on your oranges farm. Then, the sample would, say, be defined as the 100 oranges you picked. And that is the clever thing about theoretical statistics, you do not have to pick all your oranges. The statistician would calculate the proportion of bad oranges in the sample. Let us assume that 3 out of the 100 oranges are bad, so the observed proportion of bad oranges in the sample is 3 divided by 100 or 0.03 or 3%. The statistician might conduct hypothesis testing to find out if the observed proportion of bad oranges is significantly different from a specific value, for instance, the level that FDA requires in its work with drugs. Finally, the statistician could generalize the findings to the entire population of oranges on the owner's trees based on the analysis of the sample. These analyses might give insights or recommendations based on the estimated population proportion and the associated uncertainty. This might seem like black talk to you, as it partly did to me in the Copenhagen Business School. But the point is that theoretical statistics can make you find out how bad or good your orange growing farm is doing. By picking a few of the thousands of oranges on your farm, seeing how many of them are bad, and telling you if this spells total disaster for your farm, or only disaster with a 50% probability, or only with a 5% disaster. It will also tell you how many oranges you should pick and test to be sure at a certain level, for instance, 95% sure, which will be the same as 5% sure that there are no problems. And then I will turn to the general shift in business economics and business conditions for firms at or around 1964. Basically, what happened in 1964, or at least in the second part of the 20th century, was a movement from stability to dynamism. That is true if one does not have a too myopic worldview. Before digging deeper, I must say that the year 1964 itself does not hold any inherent significance in terms of a global shift in how humans are perceived. Except that it for me was an important year, namely the year when I entered the Copenhagen Business School. That said, throughout history, human beings have held various perceptions of their place in the world and their relationship with other beings. In earlier times, human societies often considered themselves distinct and superior to the natural world, including other species. This perspective was influenced by religious, philosophical, and cultural beliefs, emphasizing human exceptionalism and a hierarchical view of the world. However, over the past few decades, there has been increasing recognition of the interconnectedness of life on Earth and the importance of acknowledging the intelligence and sentience of other animals. Post-1964, I also see a change in business economics, where their post-1964 is more focused on the dynamism of competition. Where the position of a competitor on a market is not only determined by the strength of that competitor on the market, but by the speed with which it can react and the degree of innovation it can produce. The emphasis on competition, speed, and innovation has become increasingly important in many business environments. One notable concept in this context is the theory of dynamic capabilities, which suggests that a firm's ability to adapt, innovate, and respond swiftly to changes in the market is crucial for achieving and sustaining a competitive advantage. This theory emphasizes the importance of agility, learning, and the ability to effectively utilize resources and capabilities to use new opportunities. The rise of entrepreneurship and startup culture in recent decades has contributed to an increased focus on innovation and agility. Startups often operate in dynamic and competitive environments, helping technological advancements to disrupt traditional industries and create new market opportunities. Thank you for watching this video about theoretical statistics and also about the change and dynamism in the business environment from around 1964.